Hello, coming to you from St. Martin de Porres. We're going to be meditating today on the readings for the third Sunday of Ordinary Time. And our first reading is from the book of the prophet Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah saying, Set out for the great city of Nineveh and announce to it the message that I will tell you. So Jonah made ready and went to Nineveh, according to the Lord's bidding. Now Nineveh was an enormously large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began his journey through the city and had gone but a single day's walk, announcing, Forty days more and Nineveh shall be destroyed. When the people of Nineveh believed God, they proclaimed a fast, and all of them, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw by their actions how they turned from their evil way, he repented of the evil that he had threatened to do to them. He did not carry it out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We might be familiar with the story of Jonah, particularly Jonah and the whale. But as a brief uh, aside there, um, it's technically not a whale. It's a large fish that obviously people have associated with a whale. But it's a large fish that's playing upon mythical imagery of the Leviathan, the great sea monster. That um, for the ancient Jews was but a plaything, a, a, a fish in God's fishbowl, if you will. Whereas for the other ancient cultures surrounding the Israelites, the Leviathan, the great sea monster, was uh, had like some pseudo divine qualities to it. They they feared it. Well, the image here is that Jonah, who has just survived in the belly of the great sea monster, uh, by God's bidding. God, who is in control of the great sea monster, all these mythical creatures, he is in control of them. And he commands this creature to keep Jonah safe and then to allow him to come forth after three days. Well, Jonah, after being set free by God's bidding, proceeds in this reading to do God's bidding. And he does so over a three-day cycle. So just as he was in the belly of the great sea creature for three days, and then by God's bidding, the sea creature gave Jonah up to be on dry land. So also Jonah, now at God's bidding, acknowledging the Lord as ruler over all things, he goes to the city for three days. And it's not even on the third day that the city repents, but on the first day. That's how profound it is. So, in other words, although Jonah was in the belly of that creature for three days, the hearts of man were more forthcoming. The hearts of those in the city converted on the first day. They, didn't, they did not even wait until the full duration of the time that it took Jonah to get to the end of the city, which was a three-day span. It goes to show you the potency of the divine word, that the word of God is living and effective and penetrates deeper than a two-edged sword. It sees the thoughts of the heart, and it can be our greatest consolation and peace. And for the people of Nineveh, it was. And the people of Nineveh proclaim a 40-day fast. It might, think, might make us think of the 40 days that Christ was in the desert. What we replicate in Lent of 40 days of penance. So the idea of 40 days is critical. Because ever since the time of the flood and the journey of the people of Israel in the desert, 40 has always been associated with a time of penitence and cleansing. The earth was cleansed through a cycle of 40 days and 40 nights. Israel was cleansed through a cycle of 40 years. 
Nineveh is cleansed through a cycle of 40 days. We, like Christ, go out into the desert for 40 days. So when you hear the word 40, you have to think of a, a cycle, a period of cleansing and renewal. And the close, the Hebrew word for repentance is teshuva, teshuva, T-E-S-H-U-V-A. That's if you transliterate it into English. Teshuva, which literally means to turn back. So whenever you hear the word repents in the Hebrew Old Testament, the word underpinning it is teshuva. Well, the word repent doesn't always have a moral connotation. So in the case of the Ninevites, right, it does have a moral connotation that they're turning back from their sins, right? Teshuva. But at the end of the passage, it says that God repented of the evil he had threatened to do to them. In other words, it's not saying that he morally repented, but rather it's playing upon the language of Teshuvah of he turned back. Instead of threatening them judgment and punishment, he turned back and offered them mercy and forgiveness. The deeper image here is that the people of Nineveh underwent a teshuva. And in response, God makes a teshuva as well. The only difference is that the people of Nineveh make a teshuva, a turning away from sin, whereas God makes a turning away from judgment and wrath. So just as Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed and you say to the to the tree, be uprooted or the mountain, be uprooted and planted in the depths of the sea. Well, if you but have an atom of faith or an atom of love in your heart, you can move the very heart of God. Our responsorial psalm is, teach me your ways, O Lord. Your ways, O Lord, make known to me, teach me your paths, guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior. Remember that your compassion, O Lord, and your love are from of old. In your kindness, remember me because of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, thus he shows sinners the way. He guides the humble to justice. He teaches the humble his way. In many respects, this psalm, which is chosen very appropriately for the readings today, it reflects the, the cry of the heart of the people of Nineveh. It's not originally meant to be the prayer of repentance that the Ninevites made in our first reading. But when you look at the theme of it, it's as if it could be put on their lips. Remember that your compassion, O Lord, and your love are from of old, and your kindness remember me because of your goodness, O Lord. That sums it up. You know, every human being has their own aspect of brokenness. But deep down, when you get beneath the brokenness, it's really a reflection that we want to belong. We might find certain ways in which we try to belong that might not be helpful for our well-being. They might not help us flourish. And that's where you get into the issue of vice, for instance, right? But when you get deep enough, what's underlying both the, our decisions for what's good and what's bad, when you get deep enough, we just desire to belong, to be cherished to be unconditionally loved. And so when we cry, remember your compassion, O Lord, and your love are from of old, it's an echo in the heart that, Father, we thought that we always belonged to you. Help us to recognize again that we have always been yours and that we have never been separated from you. And so... May we see this psalm as a reflection of the cry of the heart that even in the midst of any brokenness that we might have, when you go deep enough, you'll find a cry of the heart that's seeking to belong with God, even if we're not consciously thinking of it as God. 
So may that be a blessing to you today. Our second reading is from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. I tell you, brothers and sisters, the time is running out. From now on, let those having wives act as not having them, those weeping as not weeping, those rejoicing as not rejoicing, those buying as not owning, those using the world as not using it fully, for the world in its present form is passing away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. St. Paul gives us a very strong reality check here. Because we tend to go through our day um, in the midst of whatever craziness is happening. We tend to go through our day with a certain rhythm or pattern. And St. Paul is not disparaging that pattern. He's not saying that uh, we shouldn't have a cycle of life. Of course, everything in nature is based upon a cycle given to it by its creator. So he's not rejecting this order, our way of doing things. But he's asking us to remember that it's within a wider framework. And that framework is that we're returning to God. As much as things might be cyclical in our life, we go to school, do our homework, go back home, dot, dot, dot. Or we go to work, do our job, then come back home to our family, dot, dot, dot. Whatever the cycle is, in the end, the cycle loops into eternity. So I want you to think of everyday life like a circle and most days repeat a certain pattern for us but at a certain point the circle won't go straight back around to continue the cycle but rather it will extend and loop into eternity and so that's why when saint paul says the time is running out he's describing when we will all be gathered up to god whether through our own death or on the last day and in that sense, the circle loops out and goes into eternity. So it's a reminder of the transient nature, the temporal nature of life. But that's not a bad thing. Because every good thing that we have, which is from God, is at the same time not God himself. God is the only kind of goodness, beauty, and truth that is everlasting. Every other kind of goodness, beauty, and truth that comes from him, that's created, is certainly admirable and we draw near to it, right? That's why we love these things, but because it's not God himself, it is not eternal. So God offers us a path where we can take what's here and unite it to him, and by uniting what's earthly to what's heavenly, we can allow it to endure. So may we do that. May we unite ourselves to what is heavenly. May we unite ourselves to that goodness, beauty, and truth that is eternal. And by doing so, become eternal in God. Our gospel passages from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As he passed by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting their nets into the sea. They were fishermen. Jesus said to them, come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. Then they abandoned their nets and followed him. He walked along a little farther and saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They too were in a boat mending their nets. Then he called them. So they left their father Zebedee in the boat, along with the hired men, and followed him. The gospel of the Lord praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So, Mark sets the scene 
as this. We have the ministry of John the Baptist. He baptizes Christ. And after Christ undergoes his temptation in the desert and returns, John, who is afterwards arrested, he's in prison awaiting death. And Jesus, in fulfillment of the Baptist and all the Old Testament prophets, announces a time of repentance. See, Jesus is the culmination of all that came before him. That's why he begins by saying, this is the time of fulfillment. This is, he's saying this is the time of culmination. He is the omega point, the end point. And then that exhortation, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. That is very similar to Jonah's proclamation. Jonah announces to the city, uh, how did he phrase it again? He says, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be destroyed. That's his message. So in other words, he places it in negative terms. And obviously I don't use the word negative in a, a pejorative sense. What I mean is that he's describing an absence of something. 40 days more and Nineveh shall be destroyed. Whereas Jesus phrases it positively in terms of what is actually present. The kingdom of God is at hand. It is among you. How? It's present in the person of the son of the king. Jesus, Emmanuel, God is with us. If he is with us, then the kingdom of God is truly at hand. At one point during the lifetime of David... When he fled from his son Absalom, as Absalom's troops were approaching Jerusalem, David asked the commander of the cavalry to guard, guard the city. And as David was fleeing to rally his troops in other areas to fight another day, as he's fleeing Jerusalem, the cavalry commander comes up to him and David turns to him and says, I want you to go back to the city. I told you to defend the kingdom. And the cavalry commander insightfully said, the kingdom of David is wherever David is. Also, also, when Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand, he's saying the kingdom is wherever the king is. And behold, Emmanuel, God is with us. The king is in our midst. So therefore, the reign of God is quite literally at hand in the hands of the Messiah. And so in a moment of continuity, and yet in a moment of fulfillment, Jesus begins the proclamation of the gospel. It's a moment of continuity because just like Jonah, so did all the Old Testament prophets make an exhortation, a prophetic call to the people of Israel to turn back to God. Teshuva, to turn back, repent. So Jesus begins by saying, repent, Teshuva. But yet, he does something new. Because it's the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. So it's not merely the culmination of what came before. Behold, I make all things new. And that's why, similar to how God would call Abraham. Right? And the prophets. Through an intimate call. They would hear his voice and they would respond and follow him. So also, the voice of God that Abraham and the prophets heard takes on a literal form in the voice of Jesus, God's beloved. The voice that Abraham and the prophets heard becomes flesh, becomes actual breath, actual human breath. An actual human voice in the voice of Jesus of Nazareth. God's presence among him, among us. And so, as he walks along the Sea of Galilee, 
It's just like God walking in the Garden of Eden. It's just like God drawing near to Abraham and the prophets. And he simply says, the, Jesus says to them, follow me. He says that to us, follow me. So may we have an intimate encounter with him, just like the apostles did and the disciples did. How he says, follow me. May we follow him. May we hear his voice. Especially as we draw near to the Eucharist. I hope this has been a blessed podcast. May you have a peaceful Sunday. And may the word of God be nourishing to you. Peace and blessings.